First, uh, truth in advertising. I, I have to tell you uh, that I had prepared this lecture uh, earlier this summer for uh, an occasion of the opening of the Hopper Show uh, at uh, Bowdoin in Brunswick. Uh, and I, but I had thought that since I'd put it together, it might be fun uh, to do it here uh, as a second run, uh, if only to encourage and stimulate some of you uh, to go down and see that um, remarkable exhibition called Hopper in Maine. Uh, in addition, there are a couple of other YF exhibitions in Maine this summer. Uh, one at Bates College of drawings by uh, Andy and Jamie Wyeth. And then, of course, at the Farnsworth Museum and the Wyeth Center is a remarkable little show from their holdings, but also on loan from a Japanese museum of about 40 or 50 uh, working drawings and watercolors related to the Olsen house, and particularly uh, his great iconic masterwork, uh, Christina's World. So one can make a remarkable circuit um, uh, uh, to see these, these uh, two artists uh, nearby. Uh, Bowden had asked me, um, in conjunction with the Hopper Show, uh, if I would, uh, and they chose the topic, asked if I would uh, do a lecture comparing or talking about uh, Wyeth and Hopper, two artists that I have worked on uh, to a degree, not, not as much as others. Uh, I, of course, I was involved in the big uh, Helga exhibition in the 80s, uh, and I've on and off written about single works and a little bit about Hopper, but it never occurred to me, uh, in a sense, to put together these two masters of American a realist painting, uh, and it was a it was a fun exercise, and uh, so uh, I, we'll see how it goes. But but that was the premise of um, uh, of this uh, topic. Before turning the slides on, let me just make uh, three or four general observations, uh, because the, in a way the whole point of a comparison is not only what they share together um, in various ways, and I'll try to highlight that, but in the course of it I hope also to help, um, in a sense, uh, distinguish uh, how each of them in some ways is quite different. Uh, and that's the fun of, of making comparisons, is what are the echoes that reverberate, particularly visually, back, uh, back and forth. Uh, but, uh, and because these two artists live for such a, such a long time, um, uh, we think of them as being contemporaries. The two great or greatest um, uh, realists of American art of modern times, the 20th century and in Wyeth's case, uh, living into the early 21st century. But the fact is that the, their actual chronology uh, is, is, is quite off. That is to say, uh, Wyeth was younger uh, by a good, even more than a generation. Hopper was born in 1882, died in 1967. I, I did meet him once, uh, I think it was at a, a dinner at the Met uh, in 1965 when they were opening a big exhibition of, uh, uh, of their uh, American drawings and watercolors, and, and I ended up happening to, ha happening to sit uh, at his table, and even sitting down, Hopper seemed uh, taller than anybody else around him. He was, he was something like 6'7", or 6'8". I mean, he was a very tall individual, and even sitting down, that tall spine uh, stood up. It was, it, was, it was something that just struck me in the back of my mind, uh, how much he seemed um, you know, uh, physically uh, uh, higher, taller than the rest of us. Uh, Wyeth was, uh, by contrast, a, a, a very good friend uh, for over 40 years, uh, and so I had worked with him uh, and, uh, and, and thought about his art, talked about it uh, for a long period of, of time. So there's some discrepancies there. But um, uh, Hopper was born in 1882, lives to 67. He uh, grows up north of New York, uh, Nyack, New York, um, comes to the city, and almost immediately, really, his first artistic experience is uh, uh, in Paris. He goes to Paris, as many um, uh, young American artists did, that, did at that time, m most of them under the uh, influence of the Stieglitz Circle. But Hopper goes uh, to Paris, paints a bit in the countryside, and when you look at those very early works, you see his first interest in landscape and, and in a broader brushwork, uh, although we can also make connections for, with his um, first paintings of the Seine River and the, and the Louvre beyond the banks of the Seine, in a sense set up what he will do when he returns to New York uh, in the teens. 
uh, uh, painting, of course, the Hudson River and the East River in New York City. Uh, and he returns then uh, uh, about, I forgot, 1905, 1906, settles into New York as a young artist in his early 20s, uh, falls immediately under the influence of um, uh, Robert Henry, the great teacher running the most famous art academy in New York at the time, successor to William Merritt Chase. Uh, and Hopper's first real influence then, in New York at least, is the Ashcan School. And so uh, the form formation of his style comes out of, um, uh, in some ways, a loose acquaintance with post-impressionist landscape or, uh, or late impressionist landscape in France and, uh, in a sense, New York scenery. Uh, he becomes very much a New York artist. Um, uh, and that's the first real difference uh, between the two. Uh, Hopper will be essentially a landscape of the city, the urban scene, uh, and of architecture. And I want to argue, and we'll see this in a moment, uh, even when he is painting in Maine or Gloucester or Cape Cod, uh, it's architecture in the landscape. Uh, Wyeth, uh, by contrast, is not born till 19, uh, 1917, and of course lived uh, until just a couple of years ago, died in January uh, 2009. And so, you know, uh, as I say, from 1882, 1970, that's a big spread. Um, and and uh, uh, Wyeth lives a lot longer, lived to the age of 91 when he died in uh, uh, 2009. Uh, Wyeth, is, as we know, was brought up in the illustrator's tradition, self-educated largely in his uh, father's studio with an awareness of his grandfather's, uh, 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 of, of his father's work with um, uh, the, the whole illustrational tradition, uh, and ended up basically spending most of his life life, 99% um, of it, in two places as we know. The Brandywine Valley outside of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, Delaware, uh, 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 in the winters, and approximately six months in, uh, initially in Cushing, Maine, um, uh, in the summers. Later, in later years, the last few decades, he and Betsy acquired islands off uh, the shore uh, of Muscungus Bay, uh, halfway between Port Clyde and uh, Monhegan partly to get away from crowds, but partly because of a, of a new interest in preserve, just, not just painting landscape, but preserving landscape. Uh, and Wyeth, in a sense, then, is uh, a, a land, uh, an artist much more oriented towards landscape. So those elements of their lives uh, it sets the first, uh, in a sense, contrast. But we tend to think of them as so similar uh, because both of them had such long painting careers. The only other one I can think of among American artists of their time was, of course, George O'Keefe, who lived uh, to, uh, to the age of 99 when she died in the late, uh, the late 80s. Um, Hopper, it was, as I say, really uh, paints formally from, uh, oh, call it 1905 up to 1965, a career of uh, literally six decades. Wyeth's career uh, went on for seven full decades. We know that his first um, exhibition was at the age of 20 uh, at his dealer in New York uh, of watercolors. Uh, uh, and that exhibition was almost immediately sold out uh, as a 20-year-old. Uh, and so from um, uh, uh, the, the, the 20s, uh, uh, well, not but this would be the late 20s, uh, to, the, to um, 2000, his last dated tempera uh, was um, uh, the late summer of 2008. So Wyeth literally was actively painting uh, professionally uh, for almost seven full decades. So there is this overlap. They did meet, uh, I think, periodically. Wyeth, we know several times, had said that Edward Hopper was the... Um, the, the greatest American artist whom he admired. Uh, I don't know, and, and I don't know that we do know uh, whether Hopper ever commented on Wyeth's work. Uh, so there is that, <coughs> there is that closeness. Uh, the second point to be made, and I'll illustrate this also in, in just a moment, uh, is that both had very strong, even powerful wives, artistic wives. Joe Hopper um, was herself uh, an artist, aspiring artist. Uh, <coughs> Uh, half of the correspondence between them uh, has been destroyed. Uh, uh, Hopper's correspondence, we know from the biographies of Gail Levin, and particularly feminist writers, that there is now a real argument that um, 
uh, 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 Joe Hopper, uh, very much in a sense both loved and protected Edward Hopper's work, was his registrar in a sense, but also I think deeply resented it. Uh, it's a very, must have been a very complicated marriage. Uh, some have even argued there was uh, uh, almost a kind of abuse there by Hopper uh, of his wife. And yet she stuck with him the entire time. She modeled frequently, again, as, uh, as we'll see. Uh, Betsy Wyeth um, was, I think, uh, still a, a teenager when uh, Andy pr proposed and married her in Cushing. Uh, and that was also a, a, a close marriage to the very end. She also uh, has been a very protective wife of his legacy uh, early on, <coughs> beginning back, I think, in the 60s or 70s, uh, began work on <coughs> the <coughs> catalog raisonné of Wyeth's work, persuaded Tom Watson of IBM uh, to give her the some of the first computers to set up a work on a catalog raisonné. And so she, too, has been a kind of registrar, mentor, protector uh, of um, his work, not only in his lifetime, uh, but in uh, handling, uh, handling his estate. Uh, she wasn't an artist herself, and yet I want to argue was in some ways. That is, say, particularly in uh, the last decades when they moved out to Benner and, and Allen Island in the Skongus Bay. Uh, Betsy began the work of really landscaping those islands. And when I say landscaping, clearing them, cutting views, opening up ponds, dredging here and there, bringing buildings out from the mainland that look like, and in fact some cases were, Wyeth buildings, a schoolhouse, a sail loft that he painted out years before in the mainland have been moved to their islands. And so the uncanny thing, uh, if anyone has a chance to visit today, uh, the amazing thing to me is how much those islands physically now look like Wyeth landscapes. Enormously creative and again a very complicated re relation. We also know that um, from time to time uh, she had no hesitation about commenting on her husband's work, suggesting in some cases uh, remove a bird from this corner of the painting, put another one in over here. Uh, we know she was active, uh, has been actively involved in the titling of Andy's pictures, uh, sometimes with poetic titles. But it's going to be very complicated legacy sorting out uh, because the, 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 the titles themselves often carry uh, uh, reverberations of meanings that we're not entirely sure in every case are Wyeth's own uh, or this more collaborative input uh, from his wife. So that too is an element that I, uh, is a very fascinating one to sort out. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, uh, just in terms of painters, we know that they were both great painters in what I call the plastic medium, but they are a difference. Where Hopper was a traditional painter in oil, uh, Wyeth, of course, as we know, took up uh, the rarefied form of egg tempera. Uh, uh, and also um, uh, uh, dry brush watercolor, uh, which is a much chalkier, drier. It's a kind of medium that allows for pictures halfway between oil paintings and watercolors. Both of them, of course, were master American watercolorists. So you have these, uh, this uh, um, combination of, of careers that are built out of larger, generally solid, substantial plastic oil paintings, and then the freedom for both of them of working in uh, the freshness, the transparency uh, of watercolor. Uh, and as I say, in Wyeth's case, t uh, tempera versus, uh, versus oil. And then the final point I would make uh, is uh, th their years in Maine. I've already said that Wyeth lived in, um, uh, 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 or has come to Maine uh, for really half, a uh, half, good half of the year, uh, uh, regularly and ritually every year since his childhood. Uh, Hopper's years in Maine, uh, we think of as being much more expansive, but in fact was limited to just under a 15-year period, I think I want to say between 1914 and either 1928 or 1929. Uh, the, the exhibition, if you do get a chance to see it, uh, is a wonderful combination of small and large works. It opens with a room of a remarkable group of about three dozen Monhegan oil studies, small oil studies, 
uh, that Hopper did on the island uh, in the summer of 1923. So it's all one summer's work. Very strong, powerful little oil studies. And then you move into the, uh, the larger galleries uh, with many of the great paintings um, of the uh, 20s, uh, of the main lighthouses, particularly Portland Twin Lights and, uh, and, and Cape Elizabeth. So in fact, Hopper's main experience, uh, while it makes an interesting comparison with Wyeth, uh, is a much more limited one. As I say, what, a, a not even a quarter uh, of his uh, total output. All right, with those generalizations as background, let me begin with two images that I wanted to, uh, in a way, call coded self-portraits. Wyeth on the left, Hopper on the right. Uh, Wyeth's painting, I think, dates from the mid-90s. Uh, he called it um, Breakup, which has a variety of reverberations. Uh, these are, in fact, casts uh, of his hands, as you may make out. They were casts that were made at this time, that is to say, in the 90s. Uh, and I remember them sitting on a, a windowsill in their house. I don't think it was the master bedroom, but it was in the living room looking out on the, uh, uh, the Brandywine ice flows in, in the winter, uh, a, a ledge in the house. He had them made, I think, um, because he was terrified about possible damage to his hands, to his painting hands. Uh, he developed one of those, I guess it was an arthritic or tendon disease, I've forgotten the exact uh, diagnosis. Uh, and in the, in the 90s, uh, he could feel his, his hands beginning to claw up. Uh, and it, 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 uh, it, it panicked him. Uh, he had once before either broken or pulled a, a tendon or something in his hands uh, and was uh, desperately afraid of surgery. Uh, in other words, his hands worried him. Uh, they were, of course, the source of his livelihood, his identification with a painter, but he also used his hands from time to time uh, as models in his own pictures. One of the most famous cases, I'm not going to show you an image of it, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, it was for the, one of the last in the Helga series where he changed the, the, the figure of Helga to a black woman, a scene lying on a bed from behind. And Wyeth, in fact, admitted that he used his own, uh, and they were uh, long, uh, attenuated, bony fingers. He used them as the model uh, for uh, the, the then, and it wasn't Helgen any longer, but the model uh, in that painting was done from his own hands. So they served an artistic purpose, but they were also, uh, uh, as I say, um, uh, 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 crucial to his painting. Uh, and so uh, he finally uh, was persuaded to have surgery done first on his left hand, which wasn't the painting hand, and then it took another couple of years before he realized uh, that was a success, that he should go ahead with uh, having the surgery done on his painting hand. So I just go through that story uh, to, to, to suggest that, in fact, this is a kind of self-portrait, a, a subliminal, if not conscious, self-portrait. Uh, there's also something strangely surreal about it, these uh, bronze uh, cast hands floating on an ice floe outside the, ha uh, the house. I don't know, it's, it's probably too easy to speculate that the title given to it, Breakup, may or may not have had something to do with the tensions after the whole um, uh, blow up over the Helga series, uh, which he had finished about five years before. I don't really know and never had a, had a chance to act. Uh, to ask. On the right is, um, is Hopper's, one of his 19, I think, t again, 20s uh, watercolors done in uh, uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, of the First Universalist Church. And what struck me as I began to look at Hopper's work and think about it, both as we move into the main material, uh, is the isolation of the tower. Uh, Hopper doesn't always do this. Uh, but over and over again, you find him separating or calling attention to the tower, whether of a church gable, church steeple, uh, or some other spire uh, 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 in, in a composition. 
And so here my point goes back to the biographical de detail I gave you at the outside, uh, that in some ways I think we can, I think we can clearly argue uh, that for Hopper that sense of standing out, sta when he certainly when he stood, he stood above a crowd. Uh, both of these artists in some ways were quite isolated, perhaps lonely. Uh, I think in many ways Hopper did feel, um, he was not particularly a social being, uh, did feel isolated among, uh, uh, among a crowd. Uh, and so the visual isolation silhouetted there I think is a kind of self-projection of his own sense of literally towering over uh, people uh, around him. And of course what I'm setting up here, uh, as you may be anticipate, uh, is his many paintings of lighthouses, which I think really are uh, forms of surrogate self-portraits. Uh, so different as these two pictures are, they are, they are clues into these two, di uh, these two different artists. Uh, ultimately, I would say, that the, and even here, of course, you could make the, you can follow the generalization of landscape versus architecture, uh, but also, turns out, it seems to me, that Wyeth's uh, realism is almost more of a surrealism. There's something unearthly. Uh, for all of the, the accuracy of depiction in Wyeth's work, uh, there is strangeness of composition. Uh, there's this, there is something that goes, uh, as I say, into surreality. Uh, I have already mentioned that both of these artists painted their wives frequently and uh, uh, throughout their career. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, and again, I don't know that there's much to be made of it, uh, Joe Hopper uh, regularly posed nude for, for her husband uh, in the traditional sense of a model in the studio. To my knowledge, uh, Andy Wyeth never painted Betsy in the nude. He painted her regularly uh, clothed. Um, the, the, the nude portrait, or, the, or rather the nude rendering uh, of the female figure, uh, he left uh, to other neighbors, and as I say, probably most infamously, uh, to the Helga series. Uh, here, Distant Thunder, the family dog there in the field, Betsy lying, taking a nap after blueberry picking. Uh, one interesting detail here in the foreground, you can just make out uh, the cup and the basket of blueberries. Uh, there, there are a couple of wonderful little dry brush studies for, for that blueberry box where uh, uh, the blueberry box is a stand-in for Betsy herself. Both the activity and uh, Wyeth would also often do this kind of association where some ancillary object, a thing, a still life, a piece of clothing, boots for example, or here the blueberry box becomes in a sense the first portrait of Betsy, uh, Betsy herself. They're psychologically uh, quite, um, uh, quite fascinating. Uh, or here, uh, a Betsy in the courtyard of the, of the mill in Brandywine uh, called Outpost in her, her Quaker clothing, Joe Hopper modeling in, in a late, uh, later 60s uh, uh, painting of sunlight in a room uh, uh, of his wife Jo uh, there, uh, scenes uh, in the stark uh, sunlight. Uh, both of these pictures are interesting. Here's a shared thing, an element in common. Uh, that for all of the accuracy of realism, and we hold them up as the paragons of, of real American realism uh, in, in modern times, and yet there's a wonderful ab abstract sensibility underlying both these artists. The use of the square format, for example, in, uh, in Wyatt. The sense of framing. We'll see over and over again uh, the use of windows and doorways in both of these uh, artists. Uh, where the architecture of rectangles and squares, uh, whether it be window ledges, door frames, door posts, uh, whether looking inside or outside or, ha or, or a framed a part way between, uh, serves of course to set off um, the geometry of architecture or framing devices, even the geometry of the picture itself, the picture frame, with the organic form uh, of the human being. Both were very adept of that, at that kind of contrast of the organic versus the architectural. All right, next I want to just turn to make a point that both of these artists shared in common uh, a love of and an interest in uh, and were influenced by the two great masters of realism uh, from the late 19th century, namely Winslow Homer uh, and uh, <coughs> Thomas Aikens. 
um, influencing these two artists in slightly different ways, not surprisingly. Um, but if you take together Homer and Aikens, one the great master of landscape, the other the master of the human figure, and the psychology of the human figure, uh, aside from their great uh, technical abilities, uh, provide some of the great examples uh, that both clearly admired. First, Wyeth, uh, a, a, a late uh, 90s um, watercolor, Caribbean watercolor by Homer here on the left, and one of, uh, and one of Wyeth's first watercolors uh, as a young 20-year-old in the early 40s, uh, there on the right, uh, where Wyeth really spent his very first years in his first exhibition. Many of these early watercolors clearly show Homer's influence, learning the wash, the spontaneity, uh, here imitating, as you can see, the, um, uh, the palm trees, uh, the use of the white of paper, uh, and, uh, and so forth. But um, uh, Wyeth also looked, particularly in his uh, later ma mature years, at the great masterworks of Homer's oils. And one of my favorite comparisons is this one, the great 1906 picture in Andover by Homer, uh, Kissing the Moon, which I think has, a, has its own kind of reprise in, um, in Wyeth's, um, I think this is either a late 80s or early 90s work called Moon Madness, where uh, not only do we have the full moon, uh, an image that Wyeth loved to play with in a number of compositions, but this one in particular, where the exaggeration of that great sphere, um, uh, uh, literally of the full moon, is brought forward so it intersects with the edge of the, of the architecture there, uh, the circle and the rectangle, uh, in much the same way that Homer, of course, in different language, uh, brings the distance of the moon what, a quarter of a million miles away, forward uh, to uh, the crest of the wave, and hence Homer's title, Kissing the Moon. In that gesture, Homer does something very peculiar in the late works, these strange compressions of space, where Homer himself is on the threshold of what I want to call psychological compositions. Uh, 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 we're, we're caught up in the anonymity of these figures, even though his brother Charles is identified in the lower left. We don't know what these figures are doing. Uh, we don't know whether they were out uh, shooting birds or whether they were out fishing. Uh, they're lost in the trough of water there. Uh, it's a very strange picture in which, um, uh, in a sense, we are literally loosed from our bearings. Um, land and ground are, are missing here. We are literally and figuratively at sea. And this spatial compression of near and far uh, is something that I think uh, fascinated Wyeth. Um, and that we think, as I say, again, it's deceptive because we think of Wyeth as being such a realist that there's that clear recession of space. Uh, here is a, a Homer subject then uh, uh, deeply influencing um, uh, uh, the, the abstraction of Wyeth's painting. Homer's breezing up of 19, uh, 1876. Uh, sets in motion uh, many of the sailing pictures that both Hopper and Wyeth did. Uh, a typical oil there uh, of, the, of the, uh, the 30s by Hopper on the right. And uh, another uh, marvelous Homer gouache here on the left from the 70s, uh, I, I juxtapose with one of uh, Hopper's great oil masterworks, Groundswell, uh, uh, this haunting picture of 1939. Uh, you know, uh, what are they, they're meant to be turning the buoy. They hear the buoy. Uh, the, these men are all fixed on the buoy itself as if both looking and listening. It's also a strange kind of picture uh, in its emptiness. But the composition of the sailing sloop on the diagonal uh, was a favorite Homer composition, and as we've seen here now, uh, used in varying ways by both Wyeth and by, uh, by Hopper. Uh, also, as I've alluded to, uh, a, a great Homer subject gets uh, redone in different ways, namely the idea of the lighthouse, uh, which uh, both of them painted, but, but Hopper much more obsessively. Here, for example, on the left, uh, the 1900 painting by Homer, Search Light, Search Light Santiago, Cuba. Uh, and of course, there are many um, uh, Gloucester watercolors that Homer did uh, of lighthouses, particularly off Prout's Neck. But to me, it's interesting that Homer's 
we, we seldom see Homer's lighthouses. Here it's a searchlight of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the American Navy blockading uh, the Santiago Harbor in the Spanish-American War. But it's a searchlight reaching into the sky, a, a kind of emblem of modernism. Uh, it's the mystery of the new space going, uh, going vertical. Uh, it's also a very austere composition, again, something almost abstract in, in uh, Homer's late work, horizontals versus verticals. Uh, and on the right there, uh, a, a close-up of a lighthouse uh, by Wyeth, uh, uh, neither symbolic um, uh, nor psychological particularly, but interested in, uh, in pure form. Uh, one of the uh, only two or three Wyeth watercolors that I could find of, of, of lighthouses. Uh, another Wyeth there on the right, uh, one that comes very close to Hopper, uh, one of the famous series um, of Lighthouse Hill, uh, done, as I say, in the, uh, the mid to later, uh, later 20s. So you do have these parallels, but I want to just repeat um, what I said earlier, because it's in this series, and there are a good half dozen of them, uh, one in, great one in Dallas, one in the Met, a uh, number of watercolors, and after you've been through the Monhegan Room, you come into a, this wonderful series of Hopper's um, uh, lighthouses. But if you look at the compositions of these, it's not just that the towers seem to stand apart, are isolated in this famous glare of, of what I call cold sunlight in Hopper, um, uh, the, the, the paradox that he plays with of warm sunny days, but it's a cold glare. Uh, it has its own sense of isolation, of, of, of separateness in uh, the way it falls across forms. Um, but the other thing is, uh, as you can see here, the lighthouse and the, and the, light ha and the house that goes with these towers uh, are, are, as it were, visually difficult to get to. In the case of Lighthouse Hill and in many of these paintings, uh, our viewpoint, as you can see, is low down in the foreground. We are forced, as it were, psychologically and physically to have to look upwards, to climb, as it were, the hill to get there, to be a part of it. Uh, uh, they stand on the, the top horizon, and in many cases you don't see the sea beyond, which is, of course, uh, what they're pro projecting to. Uh, and we're left with that cold, isolating sky. Uh, it, it's Hopper, as I say, I, I think coming out of his own psychology, but playing with his own manipulation of perspective, of space, uh, the relatively high horizon line here, lifted at least to the middle of the canvas, again gives at least to the foreground almost a claustrophobic sense. In the case of the um, painting there on the right-hand screen, uh, you know you have the four houses, three or four houses there in the foreground, where, which are also literally blocking our view, uh, as it were, our free access uh, to the isolated lighthouse uh, beyond. To turn to Aikens, uh, particularly the human figure would be the ob obvious uh, subject that the, both these artists would turn to in looking into that American master of the late uh, 19th century. Uh, Joe Hopper again posing in New York there, uh, New York uh, uh, hotel room or tenement house. Uh, on the right hand screen, uh, suggesting a, co a, a comparison here with one of the many series uh, both done in the, in the 70s, but again Hopper uh, returning to it uh, in 1905-1906, uh, namely the William Rush, um, uh, the sculptor William Rush carving the nymph of the school kill where he has the, uh, the, the nude posing uh, uh, from behind here uh, in the foreground. Uh, Aiken's tackling as William Rush did, it's an homage to Rush, uh, the colonial sculptor, America's first sculptor, who got himself into trouble uh, by carving the nude in, in uh, prude early America uh, uh, and, and Philadelphia. Uh, Aikens himself criticized uh, for his directness, but not only in nudity, uh, but his psychological insight and power, deeply disturbed uh, his patrons. 
uh, Aikens uh, partly identifying with, with William Rush. So that's going on in, in, uh, in the Aikens subject. But what's interesting, of course, is that the uh, nude from behind is almost more erotic than the nude uh, from in front. Uh, Aikens also plays with other little eroticisms, for example, uh, the, the piece of, shi of uh, uh, ship architecture, whether it's from a, uh, a stern board or a partial stern board uh, here in the center foreground of the, of the painting on the floor. Uh, some art historians uh, have pointed out uh, that, the, that the two uh, complementary scrolls there in that piece of, of wood uh, are a play on the buttocks of the nude and that that's where Aikens places his signature in a sense psychologically caressing, uh, caressing the nude. Uh, I, 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 I think I'll refrain from going further on that. Um, even more remarkable <coughs> is um, the later series by Aikens when for the first time, it took him really to get into the 20th century, 1906, uh, to paint the, the model in uh, the Nymph of the Schuylkill, now no longer, as it were, frozen in place, no longer posing, fascinating psychologically, uh, she's now, as it were, come to life. She is uh, being, uh, so to speak, escorted off the platform in a remarkably tender gesture um, that suggests, if not a dance proposal or a, even a marriage proposal. And here again, uh, there is the hidden eroticism of the great ship figure, uh, the, the, the ship carving there, uh, the scroll work, some have pointed out, again, like a phallic form, uh, sitting, standing right in front of, Aiken, of, of the uh, sculptor's legs. And here, people have, uh, again, critics have noticed that, the, that the, um, uh, uh, the features of William Rush are those of Aikens himself. And then finally, of course, you have the, the great mallet uh, at crotch level uh, pointing towards uh, the nude. So it's not just the painting of flesh, but are these other devices and undertones that suggest male-female relations in a variety of su suggestive ways uh, that I think in their own way appealed uh, to both Wyeth and Hopper for some of their compositions. Here on the right, uh, one of the nude uh, young girls that Wyeth painted after the Helga series were over. Uh, this was a, um, uh, a, a Scandinavian girl uh, and a family, uh, a neighboring family in Maine uh, that he painted in uh, the, the early 90s, Siri, uh, Siri Erickson, uh, uh, Germanic Scandinavian family. Hopper on the left, Wyeth on the right. I simply make this comparison uh, uh, because of the play of both of these artists, in this case, uh, of, as I say, window and light uh, and the nude uh, female figure. One of the Helga series there on the left called Lovers, probably an intentionally provocative title uh, given after, uh, after the picture uh, uh, was finished. Both an architectural interest, a, a light interest, as well as, I say, the organic versus the architectural. Similar poses, uh, one of the Helga series on the right, Hopper, of course, a hotel room here uh, on the left with the empty landscape in the background, a highly suggestive picture, again, of male-female relations, uh, perhaps a, 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 you know, a quick sexual encounter. Is this a kind of Western landscape? Is this a motel room? Uh, it's never fully explained. Uh, we're just simply left with the austerity uh, of, uh, uh, of the composition itself. So as I say, there are these moments of intersection between the artists as well as differences, which opens up in a way, as I've suggested, the, uh, the, the painting by both of these artists of men and women, male, female, the gender issue. Uh, the famous hopper of Office at Night, for example, here on the left, where we have uh, the businessman working late, uh, the secretary uh, seen with uh, very uh, uh, you know, carefully emphasized buttocks there in the tight blue dress, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at the man uh, preoccupied, how long will he be preoccupied? Is there going to be something going on between these, uh, these two, as it were, after hours? And yet at the same time that Hopper suggests kind of erotic tension between the two, uh, and the glances don't correlate. He's absorbed in one way, she in another, uh, that whatever we might think is possible 
um, there's, a, there's a very strong separateness created by the composition. That is to say, the very strong vertical of the cabinet itself, her vertical form the, uh, reinforced uh, by the doorway next to her versus the isolation of the male figure against the white wall seated uh, next to a, uh, as you can see, the window frame. So even the way he uses two different verticals on either side of the composition uh, and then this very severe vertical of darkness from the, from the, uh, uh, the cabinet to his desk really separates the two uh, physically as much as uh, they might be uh, drawn together. A fascinating picture. Uh, and then there's Wyatt's uh, marvelous painting. These were um, uh, uh, neighbors in uh, Pennsylvania, a German, uh, a German couple. Uh, uh, he actually walked in on them. They were asleep. He calls it marriage. Uh, well, of course, I mean, it looks like they're entombed in their, in their coffin. Uh, uh, the most extraordinary uh, image uh, of, of marriage uh, one, could, one, could, one could imagine. Uh, there is, again, uh, this use of door frame to separate male and female. And then I compare that hopper with uh, the wonderful uh, and, and almost horrifying uh, portrait of, the, of Anna and Carl Kerner, his German neighbors in Brandywine, uh, with um, the wizened uh, Anna there in the, in, on the right, and Carl with the, with the gun over his arm, uh, pointing directly at her. Uh, uh, you almost don't want to know what they had to say to each other in the kitchen. Uh, I've suggested, and here you get into pictures that are really still lifes, uh, the way both artists use, as I've suggested, objects to, as stand-ins for personalities. Uh, the still life elements for both of these artists are often very intentional. I forgot to bring an image. There's a wonderful one of a cafeteria scene of a man and a woman sitting on different sides of a cafeteria. Uh, and the male is looking at her. She's looking out the window. Um, and in one case, he's juxtaposed to a single pepper shaker so that the phallic form, of course, is associated with him. But over near her side of the cafeteria, there's a table in front of her with a pepper and a salt shaker side by side, a kind of, a kind of uh, sexual joinder of the two. Uh, so the little details like that often, as I say, are, are uh, repetitions or uh, resonances on uh, the main figures themselves. Case in point, woman reading in Brooklyn, I love the beautiful way uh, he has her, uh, Hopper has her self-absorbed. We see her from behind uh, reading a book, a newspaper perhaps, perhaps. Uh, her isolation, her introspection even suggested by the framing of the, wom of, of the window uh, right behind her, uh, that, that familiar device we've seen. But it is the city, of course, beyond versus the landscape beyond in uh, Wyeth. And balancing her, as you see on the other side of the composition, is the table with the little vase, of the, the, the uh, tall white vase of flowers. Now, this is an age-old cliche, stereotyping of the woman associated with flowers, with nature. Uh, but it's a lovely, as it were to me, second portrait. Uh, the living element, uh, the breathing element of these flowers now that are seen in the barrenness of a tenement landscape uh, and its own play on the, on, on the woman uh, there on the left. The, la the, the right, of course, is why it's great painting now in Philadelphia, Groundhog Day, where we see a, a table setting there in the interior of the Brandywine house. Uh, of um, a bowl and a, a cup and saucer. Um, are we to read one as standing for, uh, Ker for Anna Kerner, uh, the other for the husband? That would be one way of reading it. Another more likely, it seems to me, is that the spare table setting in the foreground uh, is the feminine sphere, the sphere of the wife. Uh, and there in the background through the window, you can just make out uh, a, a, a great log that has been cut with a chainsaw 
with, its, uh, with the jagged uh, edges there uh, of, the, of the cut log. Uh, the, the almost violent aspect that we just saw in, in the rifle on uh, Carl Kerner's arm, uh, here suggested now by the masculine uh, world of, of almost violence uh, out of doors. Very beautiful, very poignant, where, as I say, simply almost nothing suggests everything. Uh, finally, just to run through a few quick sequences, formal devices that they share. I've already mentioned uh, Wyeth on the right, Hopper on the left. Uh, the, the, the remarkable inventory in these two artists of using door frames, window frames, but particularly figures standing in doorway, half inside, half outside. Uh, again, Siri Erickson, although there are Helga pictures in the same sort of pose, South Carolina morning here on the left, two very different figures, uh, but something of their insouciance in different ways is suggested by the austerity of the framing device, which in the case of Hopper allows for the glare of sunlight on the panel of the recess. In the case of Siri, uh, her, her sensuous slim body uh, accentuated by the blackness of the surrounding uh, doorway. Both artists use, as I say, uh, near aerial views. Uh, uh, end of Olsen's, a late view of the Olsen rafters seen from above uh, by Wyeth on the right, and I think a Gloucester view here by Hopper on the left. It's not one that Hopper repeated often, uh, and in many ways, again, I give there's an edge of surrealism in Wyeth. Uh, while both take an elevated view, with Wyeth, you're almost in the position of a bird hovering over, uh, literally a bird's eye view, this kind of liberation from the ground itself, uh, psychologically, uh, uh, again, almost un, uh, uh, unnerving. Uh, and indeed, it led Wyeth um, uh, in the 40s to do this amazing picture, large temper at the Shelburne Museum called Soaring, where he has a great turkey buzzard, a couple of them ho hovering over, flying you know, almost a mile high, it seems, over the Kerner Farm there uh, uh, and, the, and the Brandywine Hills uh, below. Uh, but, but in the 30s and 40s, a number of American artists, including Hopper, this one done on Cape Cod, more exaggerated than it really is, not quite elevated, but interested in the abstract, the comparison, I think, is the interest in the near abstract waves, the rolls of landscape moving off from foreground to the background. Again, reminders that I want to keep stressing that underneath these two artists' realism are these hints of abstraction, these plays of perspective and point of view, uh, compressions or exaggerated telescoping or reverse tele telescoping of foreground to background. Which brings me, of course, to the great Christina's world in um, the Museum of Modern Art not in the Farnsworth exhibition, in a way, as they've argued, it would almost have been a distraction. It's so famous. But they do have all the preliminary drawings and watercolors of her hands, the first sketches of the body, uh, the hillside, and so forth. Uh, now, this has been, of course, a much talked about picture. We almost know too much about it. Uh, uh, of course, it infuriates the authorities at MoMA and the staff, because it's, it's not only the most famous, but the, the most popular picture in MoMA, uh, the one that sells the most postcards. Um, and yet, and yet, I want to argue, you know, 1949, this is an amazing picture that goes beyond realism. Uh, if you, in your mind's eye, eliminate the figure of Christina in the foreground and draw your attention to that broad field of grasses beneath the Olsen house. Note the way Wyeth here has, and we've seen this before, intentionally lifts the horizon line as if to push that hillside forward, creating its own kind of claustrophobia, making her climb up the hill, not just with her paralyzed body, uh, but more difficult, more awkward visually and psychologically. It, it closes her in. Uh, 
We know also from actual views of the place, and if you visit the Olson House now open to the public, there are tree, there were trees in that landscape with, which for the painting Wyeth removed to make it more isolating, more in a sense psychologically oppressive, more haunting. Uh, uh, so there are elements of this picture that go beyond, in a, in a way, uh, you know, our admiration just for the, te the temperate technique of these remarkable grasses. I would also point out 1949, to me, it makes a remarkable contrast with what Jackson Pollock, you would think of as absolute spectrum opposite, was doing at this time, his drip paintings, his so-called all-over paintings, that field of grass is very much like a Pollock. Uh, that, 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 you know, it may take us a century to get beyond these two artists and, and the pigeonholing that we have done, but in fact, when the story of the sense of, of um, alienation, uh, the sense of destruction and recovery after World War II uh, is not only apparent in the inwardness of abstract expressionism, but something of, as I say, uh, this, um, this abstracted landscape uh, in, in Wyatt's work. Hopper, uh, for his part, develops techniques not identical, but make an interesting comparison. Here, one of the 20s watercolors done uh, in Rockland, his summer he visited there. I think it was 23 or 24, where he has this, as you see, a telegraph or a telephone pole in the foreground, that device I talked about in the lighthouse pictures, where he places, as it were, a visual impediment. Not only defines the foreground, but our eyes are forced to go around it. Uh, the hint of the railroad, or, a, or at least a pathway in the foreground, both horizontal and vertical, are in a sense the first steps we visually have to get over uh, to get to the tugboat there uh, on, the, uh, on the harbor uh, beyond, a device uh, uh, Hopper will use over and over again. Uh, uh, an interesting, a late reprise uh, of the um, uh, Christina's World composition, one of the very last pictures in the Helga series. Uh, and in a way, it's a, you know, there is the same horizon line, the trees restored, the houses are missing, but it's that unmistakable curved hillside. Uh, and Helga had been placed in the woods uh, in, in, in receding landscapes. I find it fascinating as the relationship between the two, uh, in a way, uh, if not fell apart, uh, the way uh, Wyeth must have sensed that the series, which ran to something like 450 pictures and both works on paper and, and, and temperas and dry brush, was, had run its course. There's an exhaustion, again, an isolation, an emptiness, a loneliness. Something is over with. Uh, as he has Helga turn in the same position of, as Christina into the hill itself. And it's a hill that blocks, in a way, her going, going further. Psychologically, here again, that Homer use of, of contrived spatial compression uh, for a psychological underpinning. And you, you can think of many Hopper pictures. Uh, there's the famous one of the house by the railroad, the marvelous Victorian house seen in the background, cut off by the modern railroad in the foreground, where Hopper is responding and exploring, of course, two worlds the 19th century Victorian world, the mechanical engineering world of the 20th century. Same thing here even in rural America. I don't know whether this is Gloucester or Cape Cod, but here the local railroad, uh, railroad track going right by a clabbered house uh, with, a, with a country crossing there in the background. These are wonderful little rural views, but the, as I say, it's these these compositional devices and tricks uh, that become so interesting and finally, uh, as I say, gave, give so much meaning uh, to their work as a whole. Uh, I've already mentioned windows. Here a remarkable building uh, uh, put up by the Wyeths on, uh, on their island. Uh, here exaggerated by Wyeth uh, in its emptiness. Uh, it was a retreat, uh, a kind of nothing building, a, a gazebo to go and look at sculpture, sit at a table, look out at the sea. Here, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, almost this darker vision that you find in Wyeth, uh, uh, seen at night with the seas building up in a stormy uh, sort of fashion, almost uh, a kind of Halloween-like. I compare that with the famous Sunday morning 
my hopper, where you have, as we know, the emptiness of Sunday morning. But isn't it interesting the way Hopper uses windows to suggest both businesses and families? That is to say, we can begin to sort out what one, two, three, four doorways on the ground level, and then comparable groupings <coughs> you can make out of windows above uh, that suggest larger bedroom apartments or smaller person apartments for two people or perhaps families. For example, the windows on the right go with one door, the, wi the three windows with the shades in the middle go with the central, with the barber shop, and so on. Uh, and then there's the marvelous black detail of a square in the upper right. Hopper's only hint in this, uh, as it were, row housing kind of, of street uh, the hint of, of uh, modern New York, the skyscraper, the towering anonymity, Hopper giving us a hint both as it were street level uh, uh, anonymity uh, and, human, and human presence through absence, uh, as well as the much larger towering, uh, in a way, crowding city uh, above. And finally, I'll end on the note, um, of, as I say, sort of, of nothingness and of abstraction. Both artists, again, just to pick out a comparison, love to paint roadways, as it were, that go nowhere. Uh, curve around hillsides, a winter, a winter roadway there uh, with only the one touch of yellow uh, uh, as it disappears not only around the corner but down out of our side. How many times have we seen that uh, that is to say, what we're not, what we don't see, what we have to imagine. Uh, in the case of the YF and on the right, it's also a, one of his marvelous paintings, how he could use, as it were, the non-colors of winter uh, uh, to suggest color and mood and feeling. Uh, so that the few touches of color, he loved those in-between seasons of autumn uh, and, and early spring, browns and tans and grays. Now you can think of them as melancholy, uh, but uh, what a tour de force of execution in both tempera and watercolor, but here tempera. Uh, if you just look at the, the variety of whites, uh, it, it's almost musical in its symphonic quality. Uh, Hopper interestingly called the picture on the left solitude. The empty road, uh, the, the, the house not clearly not occupied, the door closed to us, the windows largely covered. Um, this fascinating intersection that Hopper plays with, whether in Maine or elsewhere, of the building, usually a house that represents human habitation, but humanity is not there, set side by side with nature that age-old preoccupation of American artists of nature and civilization, in this case, the domestic and the forest. Um, again, uh, 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 not a major picture, but an inexplicable one. Uh, and so I'm just gonna end with a couple of slides uh, of some of, to me, their masterworks, both later uh, works, uh, uh, Rooms by the Sea, this extraordinary painting by Hopper, uh, now without Joe in it, uh, just of sunlight, uh, a, a painting that again approaches the level of abstraction with the various rectangles and parallelograms, uh, and then again that touch of strangeness that we've been talking about in YF, but also now in Hopper. That is to say, the doorway that steps right out into the open ocean. It's almost something out of a Magritte. It's, as, it's in a way, it's as surreal, as close to surrealism as Hopper gets. Uh, one of Wyeth's most beautiful pictures, this tempera uh, uh, called Deep Cove, where again we're looking down on the embankment of this sandbank with just the crossing of a few uh, crow's feet of some crane or birds that have walked across uh, the foreground, uh, and then reflections um, in, in uh, the pond uh, or the cove, uh, cove beyond. One of his most abstracted pictures where formal properties uh, are Wyatt's principal uh, concern. Uh, or for example, uh, who would have thought either or both of these artists could have made something out of the, the lime pits outside of Rockland? Uh, but here Wyeth paints the lime banks uh, in this, again, uh, this preoccupation with whites, 
and a few uh, dark tones there. Uh, a picture, as I say, that hovers on the edge of ab abstraction, as does uh, Hopper's entrance to the city, the entrance to the uh, uh, Grand Central Railroad in Upper, Ma uh, Upper Manhattan, where we're just, uh, as I say, uh, the, something of the, anonym the an anonymity, the alienation, as I was about to say earlier, of 20th century life, here caught just in this a sort of blank cement wall. What a powerful uh, kind of portrait of America and life in the modern city uh, that certainly uh, Hopper's experience. And the so final note that, that, that I'll end on then is that what we tend to forget about, and I don't think should, uh, here Andrew Wyeth, uh, an extraordinary finished watercolor wash uh, for one of the farmsteads in the Brandywine is as close as I think you can get to a Franz Klein. Uh, and you know, it's a reminder that Wyatt himself actually corresponded for a while in the 50s with Mark Rothko about spirituality in painting. Uh, and so, as I say, for all of Wyatt's realism, how close he comes uh, to one aspect of abstract expressionism, as Edward Hopper does with one of his late interiors, to say uh, a Deben corn of the uh, uh, California uh, Coast series. And that's what I meant uh, by the title, uh, The Modern Realism of Hopper and Wyeth. Thanks for listening.